and here we are, episode one of Star Scale Grow. Um, we thought we'd take the easy option, choose a guest internally um, to make it easy, um, basically because nobody else wanted to do it. That's not true. Everybody's lining up to be a guest. But this first series is talking about the importance of interviewing and how important that is on your culture and your ability to, to start, scale, or grow a business. So we thought this was super relevant. And so our first guest, one of our own, one of our town directors, Caitlin Fairchild. It mm -hmm. seems weird saying welcome, but welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, the reason I was keen to, to have you on board um, on, on this episode talking about interviewing was more so from your time at Explore, growing from 30-something people to around 2,000 people in a relatively short space of time. Um, and maybe sort of dig into all the, the hiring slash interviewing growth and lessons that you sort of learned along the way. Um, for, for people who don't know you, there may well be some people who don't know you listening. I oh. doubt it, but let's, let's pretend there is. Um, why don't you give us just a very quick sort of snapshot overview of who you are and your background? Yeah, cool. Hi, I'm Caitlin. Um, the funny accent is from America, not Canada. <laughs> um, the, um, I've always been in recruitment um, right out of uni um, and have kind of found my way into startups and tech um, after working in agencies for a while. Um, but yeah, Explore is a really big part of my experience. Um, in that we, I was there for four years, and in that time, we started off around 30 people um, and through initially kind of high-scale, um, fast growth of our own. Um, we grew to about 150, and then from there, we were part of acquisitions and then really big mergers. So we ended up being um, a company of 2,000 people globally across seven countries, um, and we basically had to go through the many evolutions of what hiring and interviewing looked like from a small startup to a global, fairly large company. Yeah. And they're different things, right? The, uh, the way you might totally. do things initially are, are different to how you might do things when you're, when you're a bigger business. Um, so again, I thought this might be a really sort of interesting topic for, for people who are listening, who are either in TA functions or, um, there's some early early stage companies and they've got hiring ahead and interviewing is daunting for everybody. Uh -huh. um, you know, there's, it, particularly in startup mode, when you're you know, sort of 30-ish people, um, there's there's no room for hiring misfires. Like every time you, you you have a hiring misfire, the impact it can have on your team is huge. Yes. You've then got to manage that person out. You've got misproductivity um, of that person not working out and then you've got to go through the process again and, and hiring, hiring well is time consuming, as, as you and I would both know. Um, tell me, though, I'm really curious, why do so many of us have terrible interviewing experiences? Ooh, um, <laughs> there's so many reasons why. Um, I think it comes down to probably the overall hiring culture that a company has or doesn't have um, and how they view everyone's um, part in hiring. Um, you know, if you're an organization that sees recruitment um, as a purely a responsibility of the one recruiter that you might have early stage, it's I don't think that's the right way to look at it. It's everyone's responsibility to know how to recruit, be part of the hiring process and grow their teams. Um, and if, you don't have that type of mentality, what can happen is that people see recruiting and being part of the interview process as a chore or something they have to do off to the side as instead of part of their role and part of their like, responsibility um, as a team member. Yeah, yeah. And I, I've been having this sort of conversation a couple of times over the last few weeks, sort of, sort of since we came back from, from the Christmas break. But I think mm -hmm. when, when we're interviewing leaders and you're trying to hire leaders for your business, Leaders who know how to attract and hire quality teams carry a lot more value oh, than those that don't. Definitely. I think when you move into a leadership position, a lot of people don't realize that like growing your team and developing them is one important aspect, of course, but also being able to grow your team well from bringing in external talent is also a huge part of your responsibility as a leader. Yeah. 
Yeah. So it's that it's that mindset, isn't it? That mm. if you think hiring is TA or HR or people in cultures role, their problem. Yeah, you're mistaken. No. Yeah. <laughs> Don't dump it all on us. But no, it's actually it's um I know we we always talk about this and it being um, hiring as a team sport, and that was definitely the mentality that we took, um, especially early stage at Explore. Um, it's all of our collective effort that gets us the best candidate um, for the team. And um, yeah, if you don't have this kind of team mentality approaching this, it's it's really difficult to get everyone on the same page and making the best decisions and learning how to improve the process. Um, but there's a whole lot of, you know, it's not easy to just turn the switch and be like, okay, yeah, we have a great hiring culture now. It's a lot of time and effort. Um, from everyone, including senior leaders, founders, um, to really set the tone. Yeah, and and, and you used a comment earlier um, that, that we talk a lot about, you know, sort of mm-hmm. evolution, not perfection. Um, you, you just got to start somewhere. Um, yeah. Other than you know having to replace people and loss productivity and those sorts of things, what what are the other risks or outcomes of, of bad hiring that you see? Mm. Um, well, I think from a diversity point of view, that's a risk. Um, if you don't have hiring teams that understand how to mitigate bias, um, what they're actually looking for in terms of competencies and value alignment, it's easy under a lot of pressure, you're growing, the work is there, it needs to be done, you need to fill the role to fall into bad habits. And I think that's a that's a big risk of hiring the wrong person, but also hiring someone that's just like you, because that's the easy way to do things. Um, and I think um, there's risk around candidate experience as well. Um, so that really affects your employer brand. You know, if you're not having a great hiring experience. And that includes the interviews themselves. <laughs> um, you know, candidates will choose other organizations over you. And so being able to be competitive is an, another risk. Mm. Um, when, when, you, when you go and have an interview somewhere and, it, and it's not great and you come away, thinking about that or your friends or your family ask, hey, how did the interview go? Because we, we seem to tell everyone. When we're oh, yeah. Because we're generally, genu- generally excited um, and genuinely sometimes. Um, <laughs> when we have that experience that's not great, awkward interviews, weird questions, mm-hmm. you know, those scenarios where it's clear you're getting interviewed for the wrong role, all these sorts of horror stories that we've all heard. Um, yeah. We very rarely look back and say, I had a really bad interview with John Smith. We yeah, we we, we defer to the, the company, don't we? Oh yeah, totally. Um, I think everyone's had a bad candidate experience at some point in their life, like as as the candidate, and you totally you remember the company itself, and so like candidate experience is really important. Of course, it's really important. We all know why, but like I think there's a piece of the puzzle that we forget is a huge part of candidate experience, which is the actual interview itself. Um, It's not just the communication in between it. Um, The bulk of the time they spend learning about your company is with your interview team. And if those experiences aren't great, it reflects on the whole company. Yeah. Um, And we all know about, you know, if candidates have a bad experience, they talk to their friends (laughs) and their neighbors and whoever they um, can about this bad experience. Um, and it's, it's true. That's just how, um, you know, people then go and share their experiences. Yeah. So the reputational damage to your brand, you know, by, mm-hmm. by having inexperienced interviewers um, who maybe aren't delivering uh, an optimal experience to, to the people that they're interviewing, um, mm-hmm. Whether those people are successful or not, probably important to, ah, to frame yeah. that as well. Yeah, exactly. Most, most most people want to interview you know three or four people per role. You're only going to hire one, probably. If yep. if the remainders, the the unlucky ones, don't get the role, are they 
are they leaving that process thinking, I hope another role comes up because I, from what I've learned, the experience I've had, I really want to work there, which is the best place for you to be as a business. But yeah. if those three or two or three people are leaving thinking they've dodged a bullet, you're probably not in a great space. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. So again, I think just important yeah. to think like that. Um, mm-hmm. So, so, so how, do, how do most of us learn how to interview? Like, what do we do? I feel like, yeah, I don't know. No, it, I think a lot of people learn from just mimicking others often. Like you might have a, as a candidate, you have a great interview with someone and you remember kind of what they do or you shadow a manager and you learn from them. Um, it seems to just kind of happen haphazardly. Um, and all of a sudden you're pulled into an interview process. Oh, you need to interview this candidate for us. Go do this. And there's often not that time to actually really learn a specific process, you know, what to do, what not to do. Um, you know, you put into a leader. I think also it's, it is very similar to what happens a lot of times when people are put into new leadership positions. You know, they're not necessarily taught this is how to be a leader and these are the things you need to do and what not to do. You're just given this role. And so a lot of times you're just given the role of an interviewer. And then what? You know, it, it you kind of wing it. Um, and you learn from making the mistakes. Well, I think there's probably a better way that we could all learn how to interview um, consistently. Um, and I think this idea of like hiring culture um, and hiring as a team sport, like everyone who you put in front of candidates as an interviewer, they need to know, they need to know these specifics. They need to know um, what are they looking for? What does good look like? They need to know um, what can I, can I not ask even those simple type of things, but also they need to know how do I explain our flexibility policy at my company. How do I explain the long-term growth opportunities for this role? Um, they need to also be able to represent your company in the best way. Um, and not everyone just naturally knows exactly how to answer those questions or what to do. Um, so I think an important part of what you could do is is actually <laughs> train your interviewers. <laughs> And so I think uh, I love the way you framed that there. And I think a logical way of looking at this as well is if, if, if you're not embedding these things that you're talking about, you know, how to answer difficult questions, how do you communicate policies and procedures, how do you, how do you talk about growth, is it, if you don't have alignment in the way those things are done, you end up with having individuals and teams who all have their own version of what the company is about, their own expectations of what success looks like of what mm-hmm. culture looks like. Yeah. You know, most, most businesses, you know, they, they talk about culture and they have you know, these statements, you know. Mm-hmm. You know bold. If, if we're not teaching our, our interviewers how to, how to screen for these things, how to communicate what bold means to us as a business, you end up with different versions of this and then exactly. you actually have no culture. You just have different variations of it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think um, at Explore Early Days, um, what – one of the things that we did um, was really focus on values as part of the interview process. And, um, but to be able to do that, we spent a lot of time making sure everyone understood the values and what they meant um, so that they could understand the behaviors they were looking for, for each value. But then also we spent time gathering stories and, understanding what are the examples of the values being lived and incorporating that into the interview process as well. Um, Because what we wanted to avoid was if a candidate asked one person, what are your values and what do they mean? And they asked another person later in the interview process, we want that to be consistent. (laughs) You know, we want the, that shared language to exist. Um, And so we spent a lot of time, making sure everyone knew, understood the values to be able to then incorporate them into the recruitment process. And it's the same thing with anything in the recruitment process and interviewing. You need to make sure everyone internally is on the same page before they can go, can go and 
successfully communicate and assess on the on the things that they're looking for. And 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 it flows beyond just the interview, doesn't it? If mm-hmm. if everyone's aligned on what values mean and you have this common language, this shared dialogue, that flows through into the day to day. Exactly. The way that teams talk, the way that cross functional mm-hmm. teams operate yeah. together, the way that they interact with customers. You know, it, it's it's all part of this sort of bigger picture. Oh uh, yeah. I mean I could talk forever about values and how you like things you can do to integrate them into the day to day. But I think like taking the time to do that in and of itself, that whole activity that we did um, had such positive flow on effects because it showed that we cared about values enough to spend the time to do this. It showed everyone we do care about this in the recruitment process. So candidates going through it could actually see an experience, okay, these are what the values mean. This is what everyone talks about them. And it really is reflecting the fact that we we try and live those day to day. Um, so it really ties well together when you can start that, like start signaling <laughs> what you want candidates to know at the very beginning of the process and pull that all the way through onboarding and then the, the people experience. Yeah, and 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 I agree. And, and I think it's that thing, right, of, you set the expectations with candidates around values and behaviors and you know this is what this behavior looks like in in a in a you know in a real day-to-day scenario if those mm-hmm. things aren't actually happening when 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 that yeah. person when that new employee starts one year found out pretty quickly it was all for nothing and again you, you don't actually have any value or any culture yeah um and i think like values are like a really kind of overarching example but like role specific like same thing you need to understand from the very beginning of the process everyone on the hiring team what are the competencies we're looking for what does this role actually do what's the challenges in these role in this role what are the opportunities for someone coming into this role everyone in the hiring team that's interviewing candidates need to know this so that it's consistent we're assessing the candidates consistently um and the candidates can really get a true sense of what the role is going to be so it's like making sure that interview process turns into reality once they yeah. join for anyone listening who's who's thinking hang on i've got to have meetings about values i've got to start <laughs> yeah. workshopping values and behaviors and then i've got to have meetings about expectations of a role and everyone knowing what they're interviewing for this sounds like a big investment of time and, and we get this this dialogue quite often from from early stage businesses, uh, I think my my sort of response to that is is generally, you're going to be investing time at some stage. If you're not investing it up front, I can absolutely guarantee you, when your mishires happen or when you're having to replace roles, you're going to have an investment of time then. But it's the wrong kind of time. It's reactionary. Yeah. It's, it's the painful like, time you don't want yeah. to have to do. So invest the time up front to to, to understand these things, and, and I think. Again, I think for, you know, for early stage businesses, the opportunity to get involved in that, to help shape values, shape behaviours, certainly for the leaders that you're hiring, that's that's stuff that doesn't really come around that often. Yeah. So that's stuff to get right. excited about. This isn't yeah. this isn't chore or, oh, my God, I've got to talk no. about that. Like, this should be fun stuff, right? So um, cool. Let's just touch on on, on the diversity side again. Um, obviously, we're a, a diversity-led business. Um so we talk a lot about cognitive diversity. You know, mm-hmm. tech companies that are building products for for um, for customers, whether they're B two B or the B two C or a bit of both. Um, they're generally building for a diverse customer base. So having di- cognitive diversity, different ways of looking at the same problem, um, is important. I, I I think really important to to, to flag that you know, the, the tokenism. There's a whole the, Bunch of bunch of stuff on LinkedIn. If you want to, if you want to get yourself rage farming, jump on LinkedIn for five minutes and you know, search for some hashtags around diversity and inclusion. Um, but but this this step away from from just the tokenism of we need more women in the business mm. because you think you need more women um, is is obviously the wrong way the wrong way to go. But if you're actively looking to promote diversity, giving everybody this, the same opportunity um, is is one thing. But actively giving opportunities to those that might not have them is another way of doing it. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in your thoughts around 
um, when you're interviewing, um, and I've had this one recently, you might be interviewing people for whom English isn't their first language. So, so again, your skill as an interviewer is being tested. Um, there's quite often a difference between what, what someone can say and what they mean in an interview. Like interviews are pretty daunting for all of us anyway. Like none of us like them. We'll get onto why in a minute. Um, <laughs> but from a diversity perspective, being cognizant of these things, mm -hmm. really actively going after diversity in your teams and chasing that in, in your interview process, super important. How, how, did, you, how did you approach that at Explore? Um, one of the, we kind of rooted the whole idea around diversity and, and looking at candidates differently, um, by really shifting our, our mindset around, um, we don't look at, um, culture fit. We look at culture ad. That was one thing. And I know that's commonly becoming more popular and people understand that now. Um, but we really focused on values alignment um, being kind of how we looked at that. So um, values alignment really for us was like, how do we work? How are you, you know, how, what are the kind of behaviors that will make you successful here and happy here? Um, and we, we really made that a focus alongside the competencies and requirements of the role so that we could look at someone as a more of a whole person that way. Um, you know, our decision wasn't pure, based purely on a CV and what your background was and what exactly you've done before. It was also around how you would work as a team member. How would you look at the situation with customers and how, how do you approach things? Um, and especially early on, um, we would always talk about candidates and like, what are the, what's the cool thing that they're going to add to the team? What's going to be the, what, how are they going to help us evolve our culture in a really new positive way? Um, so seeing like culture and the team as always evolving as a mindset made a difference as well. Like a change in your culture and a positive new perspective or background that you can bring into the team, that's always going to help you. Um, and I think also because we spoke about this a lot, it became again, that shared language. Like it's okay for us to like discuss and talk about like, Oh, that person has this type of trait or thing that we don't have in the team already. And if people weren't, un weren't sure about how to um, accommodate someone or questions to ask, it was open communication within the hiring team about that. Um, so I think that made a difference that we actually were open to, um, I guess, sense checking ourselves, making sure we weren't being biased throughout mm -hmm. the process. Mm -hmm. And it was an open uh, talking point always part of what we, what we did. And, and when, when you talk about things like, um, hey, what does this person bring to us that we don't already have, that sort of stuff, mm, for people yeah. listening, that those things don't have to be these sort of esoteric things. They could be something really simple like most of our customer experience team have come from other SaaS startups, but mm -hmm. this person's come from, um, you know, a, a 5,000 person business, you know, they come from Facebook or they come from, from mm. somewhere else, they've come from a, from a unicorn and they've probably been through a lot of things that we've been through might yeah. recognize some pitfalls they're used to dealing with customers um mm -hmm. you know the size of which we're probably going to start getting over the next six months so this is really cool yeah exactly you know, so it can be real real things like these not just mm -hmm. oh my god they seem like they're amazing like they get, these can be real real things yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and i think you, like yeah having that making sure that the hiring team knew exactly what competencies we were looking for they could actually zone in on that and weren't getting as you know they didn't fall into the trap of getting distracted by um things that really didn't matter to the role yep. um but as humans we naturally look for the commonalities yep. between us and candidates we might make assumptions based off of where they've worked before but if we always bringing it back to the competencies and the value alignment that made us a much more objective yeah hiring team yeah um one that that i always throw out there when i'm having these types of discussions and i think everyone's been through this um you come off an interview and someone says there's no way i could work with that person 
they had a really limp handshake. <laughs> yeah. And everyone goes, oh, yeah, I hate that. I hate limp handshakes. And, and this <laughs> then becomes the focal point of why you wouldn't hire with someone. Forgetting the absolute relevant experience, the years of, of experience doing exactly the thing that you're yeah. asking for in this role. Well, it's actually <laughs> relevant. Well, it's actually relevant or not. Um, I know what we talk about that is like, what's the signal that you're looking for? Like, what are the things that actually matter yeah. for this role? And knowing like, what am I looking for? What does good look like? And being able to be as objective as possible yeah. as the interviewer. And then as a whole team, collectively, all of the interviewers, the hiring manager, the recruiter, you have your collection of information yeah. <laughs> and um, you can make more informed and confident decisions. Then. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's talk about this in, in, a, in a bit of a practical sense again. So anyone who's listening can think, well, this sounds great, but what are the things I actually should be doing? Um, mm. I'll start off with having a hiring plan. So a documented hiring plan, a hiring process that documents what the role is, so clarifies what the role is. What are the most important aspects of this role? What are we asking people to do? What are the skills and competencies that we're looking for? Yeah. That... If we confirm that those things are present, we know we're pretty comfortable that this person can fulfill the requirements of the role. So have this documented. Then get your hiring team together so that everybody agrees and everybody knows because we've all been in, in situations where you have a first interview, everything goes well, people talk about your, your history, your experience, why you're interested in the role, the things that are relevant. You get into a second interview and you start getting asked exactly the same questions, you think, I've been here before. I've got to be the old days. Yeah, yeah. um, and, and it becomes really clear that the hiring, the interviews are really disjointed. So avoiding that by everybody being very clear on what you're looking for and what their part of the process is. Like yes, what yeah. are they specifically yeah. looking for? What are for? they tasked with? Yeah. And, and I think this idea of, Everyone understand the interview process is, a, is, a, is an information gathering exercise. How do we gather the right information that allows us to make a decision on whether we think this person can fulfill the roles and is aligned to our values, meaning they'll stay, they'll work well with us, their customers will love them and so on. Yeah. Um, so again, staying practical, this document, this HR slash recruitment produces this, gets that over to the hiring teams, gathers them together, Mm -hmm. um, everyone talks through this. This can be a five, ten minute discussion. Yep. Everyone gets really, really clear. Then the interview process, first, second interview, third, however many you're having. Yep. Who's doing those? They go into this document. So you can see it's Jane and Fred, first interview. Mm -hmm. And then under that, a little table. What are they talking about? What are the yep. things that they're trying to understand? Mm -hmm. And then it's Caitlin and Simon, second interview, lucky candidate. Yep. Um, what are the things that, 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 that they're going to be looking for? And then however many interview processes you have. So candidate goes through these, number, these, these interviews, post that hiring team gets back together and they share their feedback, their information, mm -hmm. their thoughts, their perspective, their views and their opinions. Um, one thing that we try and encourage people to do is not to, not to influence each other prior. So Excellent. keep your opinions to yourself until the meeting. Um, yes. How many times I've told people that? <laughs> um, <again, laughs> Don't people, tell the other interviewers what you think. For people that are listening going, why would you not tell them? Yeah. Hit us with well, it. Yeah. Um, it introduces bias into the process. Um, as oh. a human, um, hearing what another human thinks, um, you can be easily influenced into going along with that. Yeah. Um, there's so much... Um, so there's so many parts of the interview process that bias can come into and the more structured and consistent you are throughout the very beginning of getting the hiring team together, defining the process, running the process and debriefing, um, the more that you will mitigate that process, yeah. mitigate that bias. So things like the CEO is involved in the hiring process mm -hmm. and he's in the, the kitchen talking yeah. to one of the team who says, hey, how was that interview today? And CEO yep. says, I really liked Caitlin. She seemed great for this role. I'm really keen to keen to, to try and hire her. Somebody mm -hmm. else 
overhears that, and they didn't think Caitlin was that great, probably understandable, um, <laughs> overhears that and thinks, well, if the CEO thinks they're great, like my opinion probably doesn't matter, so I'll just go with what he wants. Yeah, exactly. So this is obviously based on the on the, the reasoning, the flawed reasoning. Mm-hmm. The CEO makes great hiring decisions. Yep. May not necessarily be the case. Maybe, yeah, maybe they don't really actually know what the role's doing. You know, like there's so many things that might make that specific one perspective um, what it is. Yeah, and and that's it. Like we're trying to bring together the different perspectives. Yeah, um, throughout the interview process. Yeah, together. Um, our goal isn't to all have the same exact feedback. Our goal is to gather that different information and different perspectives on that candidate, um, value alignment, their technical expertise, their background, like what are they looking for in the next role? All of these things come together to make a hiring decision. Yeah. And the prime requisite of a CEO is not necessarily to be a great interviewer. So it's a skill yeah. that you may not even possess. So. You might not have never been trained on that either. You know, it's just, um, I think it's, Im- yeah, I think it's important to make sure that everyone is going into the process knowing exactly what they need to do and like their part in that information gathering. Yeah. So Exercise that is interviewing. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So everyone's had their interviews. People are not sharing feedback with each other until a meeting, not another meeting. You get everybody together. You can, this can be a five, 10 minute meeting. I've been in ones that have been literally under a minute. Um, yep. Same. Explain why. Um, but essentially what we're, we're looking for is people's unfettered, unfiltered opinions of this person. Um, having some kind of scoring system. Um, yeah. Some people do one to five. Some people do one to four. One can be um, a no. strong no hire. Two can be a, a strong uh, one is a, is a no hire. <laughs> it's a strong no hire. Oh, no. Two is a no hire. Mm-hmm. Three is a hire and four is a strong hire. Yes. And if you want to get really tricky, you can put three as a, mm, I'm in the, on the fence. Yeah. So don't like doing that, which I understand. <clears throat> um, but the way we've done it before is you get everybody together and you go on the count of three, one, two, three, show us the amount of fingers for the score you're going to give. And then the recruiter's job is to go around and record that. And then one by one, go around and talk about pros and cons of yep. that candidate. So CEO, why did you love Caitlin? Talk to me first about the pros, the things you really liked. And he should have notes. He she yes. should have yeah, notes. Having a debrief session doesn't mean you don't take notes. Absolutely. Um, you definitely take notes still after your interview, but what you're doing is you're bringing your individual feedback to the debrief meeting. Yeah. Yeah. So we go through around the group, pros and cons, and what you'll see happen is mm-hmm. debate. And debate's a good thing. So this is where our opinion comes out because the CEO goes, I thought Caitlin was great. I was really interested to know how she managed um, you know, customer onboarding challenges and I really liked her dialogue around this, this, this. And somebody else might say, well, actually, we talked about that and um, our perspective was that she actually, this wasn't great. She actually said she didn't like doing it. She she had to do it in her, in her last role, but it wouldn't be her preference. So her moving into a role where that that aspect is 90% of the role. I'm not sure this is going to be a fit. Yeah. So what you're getting here is this balanced opinion, and these are extreme examples, but I'm using them on purpose. This is balanced opinion, balanced perspective, because mm-hmm. if we leave hiring decisions to one person and their opinion, we run into all sorts of problems for exactly the reason we just described. If the CEO got to hire Caitlin and she found, finds out two weeks into it that 90% of the role is doing the thing that she hates doing the most, yeah. We've got a mishire and we're starting all over again. And people go, how did this happen? And I think going back to our earlier comment about managers valuing being able to attract and hire good quality people, the reverse is also true. If you're consistently having mishires, your own staff can then start questioning your decision-making ability. Yeah. Again, we've all had the thing where someone turns up first day and you go, oh, my God, how did they get in? <laughs> you know, we've all we've all been there. Um and everyone can see that such and such person just isn't right. And two weeks later, they're, they're no longer around. You go, geez, what was all that about? That was like a tornado. Yeah. So these things have impacts. Oh, yeah. And I think, like, <clears throat> I think the way that a company shows 
how they much they care about hiring the right people, taking the time because they know the repercussions that the team feels if it doesn't work. Um, you know, that also goes into that kind of like that hiring culture mm. that you're building. Like, is hiring great people important to you or not? Like, you might say so, but how do you actually show that? Um, and like, same for candidates. Like, if you run a really chaotic interview process, everyone's asking the same questions. You're not getting really any new information. Mm. It's really tedious. It's long. It's just not a great experience. What does that tell you about how the company runs internally as well? Yeah. You know, like, I think this uh, hiring culture and the signals that you create <laughs> um, intentionally or not are important. Yeah. Um, they're, they're very good insight. I think particularly the more senior person you're trying to attract, they're very good insight into how your business operates day to day. You know, days of hiring manager turning up, you're sat in a little grotty interview room and the hiring manager reading your CV in front of you. Yeah. You've just come from another meeting. Hiring, she's like, oh, God, yeah, sorry, mate, I'm so busy. Like, this is just, this is just chaotic. It's it's unprofessional. Yeah. That is insight into how your business operates. And exactly. You Interviews are a window into the organization. You want to make sure that mm. <laughs> they're not a mm. window into chaos. Yeah. And, and and if that's how you're going to approach interviewing, the only people you're going to hire are people who are like that. Yeah. Like it's, these things are all absolutely yeah. related. Um, mm -hmm. Again, just touching on, you know, particularly early stage, like mm -hmm. hiring is a responsibility, like for, for all leaders, like it's your, your chance to make an impact, it's the thing to be embraced. Uh, again, anyone listening to this or watching this is going to be going, it sounds like a lot of time, a lot of meetings that I've got to have, but again, mm -hmm. It's, have the right meetings. Don't have the okay. Now we've got to replace yeah. that role again. Exactly. Don't have the panic meetings yeah. when, and then it's just a snowball effect. You make a, a a bad hiring decision that puts so much pressure on the existing team, and then you have more pressure to hire someone to replace that person. It's a lot of time that's not well spent. Mm -hmm. um, that upfront work, yeah, feels like you're really going uphill at first, but the more that you bring everyone along for the journey and get their input and reiterate and improve, it just gets easier and easier. And like it, hiring becomes fun when you have a whole team that's excited about it. Yeah. They know what they're, what's expected of them. They know what they're looking for. Candidates have a great experience. Yeah. You, know, you, then you have a, a hiring culture that's working. Yeah. Um, and, and, I, and I really like this idea of, as it, it's it's like any sport, using the sport analogy, the more you do it, the more you practice, the better you get. Cool. Um, and yeah. the better, gradually, the better hiring decisions you can make are. Mm -hmm. I, I also really like this idea of being able to spread the burden of interviewing because it is a, it is an investment of time, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, you're cool. shying away from it. Yeah. But but if you can have a team of competent interviewers that are all aligned across your teams, you spread the time burden, the impact. You know, nothing worse than you have a candidate that everyone's excited about, but you can't get into a, to an interview because There's Mary's on leave for two weeks and she's the person who yeah. is, you know, you're, exactly. you're supporting this. This is, this is not, it's not sensible. It's not productive. It's not optimal for, for, a, for a high performing business. Um, exactly. Again, you know, the more that you, I think like a lot of times companies will have a way of hiring that exists, yeah. but it's not really documented. Or it's not really clear. If you're a new person coming into the organization, how do you how do you learn it? Kind of through time and just chance, or but you're part of a process. I think it's all about making the implicit explicit, making it clear. Make sure that everyone knows they've got the resources, the tools they need. When you have a new person join as a manager, teach them how you interview. Yeah. Teach them what's important to you as an organization when they're speaking to candidates. Yeah. Like give them the empower them to be actually be part of the process um, and keep building that capability within your business. Yeah, agreed. Um, Easier said than done, I know. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> you have to start somewhere with it. Yeah. yeah. That's um, we've covered a fair bit, and I agree we could sit here and, and, and talk all day. Um, so 
if we were going to give people sort of a couple of sort of headline things to take away from this, mm. firing is a team sport. Yes. Get people involved. Hiring is a team sport. Everyone needs to know their role and what the play is before they go on the field. Like, think Ooh. of it that way. God, you're good at this. <laughs> okay. what's, the, what's the other big point? Um, I think the shared language yeah. and knowledge, um, I think, has a lot of value to it. Yeah. Um, making sure everyone's on the same page. What does a debrief mean mm -hmm. at this company? What does good feedback mean here? Everyone knows the ins and outs and is brought into the knowledge of what, what interviewing means. Um, so to use a sporting analogy, it's team sport, common language, mm -hmm. um, everybody understanding the game plan, the strategy yeah. to use another so, sporting yes, analogy. Yeah, definitely. Um, and the, the third one that I'd, I'd say, we haven't really touched on it, but, but I think this um, constant training, again, to use a yeah. sporting analogy, constantly yeah. training and learning. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that I, I particularly like doing with with clients in the past is monthly retros on hiring. So if you're if you're interviewing and if you're hiring ten people a month, mm -hmm. um, there's great opportunity there for your hiring teams to come together, you know, coffee, or lunch, whatever it is, and doing hiring retro. What's working well? What isn't? Have we do we have enough breadth across our across our interviewing? capability like are enough people trained yeah. if we know our headcount forecast is going to grow from mm -hmm. from 100 to 250 over the next two years we need more interviewers it, yeah that's just the reality that's yeah yeah <laughs> otherwise the same people are doing interviews and they also have a day job as well so yeah we need to spread the load so i think retros are a really good idea um hr slash ta professionals are listening to this if you're not doing retros we'd strongly encourage it's you really to easy thing to start um you have to start the training somewhere um and getting just the, that discussion going mm -hmm. what's the feedback you're not hearing or what are the issues that interviewers are having during interviews that you just don't know about yeah like yeah that you so much that it's probably not being said yes well yeah what do you what do you what would you, what you never mean? know if you didn't have those discussions there that's the gold and that's where the yeah. incremental in, increases mm -hmm. in quality, competence, all these things happen. So yeah. Um, where should people start if they want to get better at interviewing? What could they do? Um, where to start? I think um, I think what I was saying before around making the implicit explicit is a good place. Start what what are you doing right now? Get it down on paper. Mm -hmm. Start doing hiring kickoffs yeah. is a really easy way yeah. to get this going. So making sure everyone at the beginning of a process of a new role is brought together, understands what they're looking for. And that's where you'll be able to really find the gaps that you have at the moment. Like do interviewers know what questions they need to ask? Do they feel comfortable running these interviews on their own or do they need help? Like work out those issues with what you've got right now. Yeah. Um, and then really start thinking about what is the way of hiring what, what um, at your company. Yeah. So, What's the explore way? What's the crew way? What's the whatever way? Yeah. And start documenting that and making that part of the process to be an interviewer. Yeah, perfect. I would Brilliant. say. <laughs> and think ahead. I think like we we just had a client that um, we did interview training with, and they recognized they needed to do this because they were going to have a huge hiring push in 2023. So they were proactive. They did this beforehand. I think. That's also part of it. If you can recognize you need this, do it sooner than later because you're not going to want to deal with trying to get everyone upskilled to interview when you're in the pressure cooker of trying to hire 20 people in a month, whatever that may be. Um, so something that needs to happen early and then continue. Yeah. If you know there's going to be a spike. Right. And hopefully that should be coming from someone in your in your people team or your HR mm -hmm. team. Yeah. You don't have one. Someone in operations should probably be thinking mm -hmm. about, hey, this is where we're going yeah. in the next six months. Hiring's yeah. going to have an impact. Yeah. And the, the flip side of that, and we've seen this with clients in the past as well, is being able to think about onboarding. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you've got to take yeah. 30 and you're going to hire 20 in the next two weeks. Uh, sorry, the next two months. That's 20 new people coming on board. Who's going to onboard them? Like, Who's spending all the time training? I know, yeah. There's a lot of time involved in 
all of this. <laughs> but I think like if you are preparing for hiring and you want to make sure that you have a great candidate experience and you're making the right decisions, a big lever you can pull is making sure that everyone's competent interviewers yeah. and that the messages are getting out that you want. Everyone understands your values, understands your benefits, knows what they're looking for. Um, you can do only so much of like bringing candidates through the funnel and having great communication with them as the recruiter. But if the actual interview experience is not great, you're always going to be stuck. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Um, 45 minutes. I think we uh, we did well. Cool. Um, I hope this wasn't too daunting for you. No, it was fun. <laughs> I feel like we talk like this all the time. <laughs> so, we could sit in literally too late. I feel yeah, like we could talk about this forever. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Absolute pleasure. Let's do a follow-up one where maybe we get a little bit more granular about yeah. the steps of an interviewing, how to prime, open, yeah. and probe. Sounds good. Perfect. Yeah, I think that's probably a whole other <laughs> show. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Until next time. Sounds good. Bye.